So, hi everyone. My name's Claire. I'm a consulting archaeologist and I've done a lot of work with games. I'm currently working on an unyet unannounced game coming out later this year. And I'm going to start off today by telling you guys how when you're making a historical game, you can dramatically increase the quality of your game by bringing on an historian, archaeologist or anthropologist. Um, I'm going to be talking about my two favourite games to prove my point, um, Assassin's Creed Origins and Horizon Zero Dawn. Basically, an increasing amount of games in recent years have started to be based in history. And uh, it's usually glaringly obvious, at least to me, when developers do their own usually cursory research or worse, no research at all. So at this point, you're probably thinking, well, why bother making a game accurate? I mean, it's a game. Well, I'm going to tell you, so strap in. This should work. Basically, there are a number of reasons why you should bother making a game historically accurate. The first one is that you can build a better environment faster. Games made in a historical setting come with their own pre-built environment, basically giving you a framework to work with. The second one is that history inspires great characters and great settings for you to explore your narratives with. Uh, it can work as excellent inspiration for both historical games and for worlds in fictional universes. And finally, history is cool. People think so. <laughs> so, how can history help you make a better environment? Well, we all know that history can complement video games by creating an interesting setting that the audience is at least vaguely familiar with. When a game is set in a historical setting, you get a pre-built, rich environment, and you also get to save time on explaining the character's surroundings. I mean, look at this guy. We know who this guy is. We can infer his situation right there. By saving time and money on explaining the setting, you have more time to get a good game by putting in the extra details. And how do you do this? Well, you research. A really great example of a well-researched game is Assassin's Creed Origins. Now, I was initially really nervous when this game was announced because my previous research was in Ptolemaic era Egypt, which is when this game is set. And it always just kills me when developers slightly adjust the facts to fit with their vision. Um, especially considering that in Egypt there's not a lot of documentation on the average life of Egyptians and considering the a massive amount of mysticism that goes with the error. I was really, really nervous that the developers would take advantage of that. Which, you know, to be fair, they did. Uh, but they also did a lot of other stuff. I mean, they did their research and not just the basics. Uh, they built an environment that feels authentic. I mean, sites like this are in the game and they make the world feel real. I mean, you can see a good example of the kind of research they did. They, they recreated the monument at Abu Simbel. Assassin's Creed Origins also focuses on smaller details. I mean, they scattered text throughout the game that links to history. I mean, letters and prayers beliefs that are common throughout Egypt are everywhere throughout the game. They also show accurate hairstyles and clothes. I mean, all they had to do to do this was to find portraits of people that actually exist in real life and use that as a framework. They use that as a reference point. And things like the plait on top of the head, the fringe on the guy, and many others like them, it makes the game more realistic and therefore more immersive. When you have a background that's based in fact, people are more likely to believe what they see. And even something relatively small, it can be enough to get people interested. So essentially, by using pre-existing material that can be found in history, you can construct detailed and immersive environments. You can also focus on detail and in the end get a qu higher quality game, which brings me to my next point. So let's imagine that you're making a game that's set in history. 
Maybe you've set it in Japan or America. Maybe you've set it in Viking era England. You're working with open source to get the, you know, with the game development and it's working well on the technical side of things. But unfortunately for you, you just don't know that much about Vikings. I mean, what do you do? Well, one method would be a Google search. Another method would be to use the real history through research, which historians are really good at. By using history, you get an excellent you, by using history, you get an excellent source of compelling characters, and you can use real history to inspire your games. I mean, take a look at Vikings, for example. Vikings have a whole bunch of history that isn't common knowledge. For the fact that they settled Javik, that later became known as York, and turned it into a massive industrial hub at the time. Also, the fact that they had a much more diverse raiding party than people assume, with women fighting right up there with the men. By using real history, you're introducing new ideas to the audience and presenting them with new information, which is more likely to hold their interest. Furthermore, aspects like this add nuance and depth to pre-existing settings and are the result of good research. Without good research, you're likely depending on pop culture and common knowledge, which usually means ending up going with stereotypes, and there are a number of problems with this. Firstly, stereotypes, while familiar, are usually inaccurate. By definition, they rely on a popularly known idea of something, but they're very rarely based in any kind of truth. I mean, The Last Ninja is a great example of this. We, most of us know that ninjas did not wear black masks and flip off buildings. I mean, the Hitman games would probably be a bit more realistic in this, you know, changing costumes for the sake of infiltration. The second problem is that using stereotypes could offend and therefore alienate people, which is never really helpful in open source. Open source development, as, as you guys probably all know, means that there are going to be will likely be people of various different backgrounds working on your game, and therefore people coming from various different ethnic backgrounds. If people are offended by the work that you're doing, they're not going to want to help you in your game, and you're losing valuable input to your project. And finally, history is more interesting anyway. By their very nature, stereotypes lack the detail that you get from history. I mean, we can, we can have a look at an example here. The Call of Juarez is a Western shooter. I feel like those are the only words I need to use for you to understand the basics of this game. Uh, it takes the staples of Western movies and makes it into a game. Now, this doesn't make it a bad game. I mean, it, Call of Juarez pioneered ah, a bunch of the shooting mechanics that other games have since utilised. The issue is that by taking popular culture this game is made from a mould and with settings and characters that the audience is already familiar with. While this can be good for simplicity, accuracy is richer and more interesting than these oversimplified and watered down tropes. This doesn't mean that you have to make everything accurate. By drawing from history, you can make deeper characters for quite little effort. It's perfectly summarised in a quote by Marisha Pessel. She says, within every elaborate lie, there is a kernel of truth. Drawing on a historical period doesn't mean that everything needs to be accurate. But in fictional universes, authenticity can come from taking something true and drawing from it. A game that does this really well is Horizon Zero Dawn. Now, anyone who's played the game, anyone who can see the screen is thinking, hey, that game's not set in a historical period, it's post-apocalyptic, it's set a thousand years in the future. And my answer to that is almost a dirty word in my field, anthropologists. <laughs> <laughs> Even though it's set in the future, Horizon features a number of different cultural groups that draw from real-world examples. And it benefits from that by presenting cultures that are realistic and believable. The game, for those that aren't familiar, involves encountering a bunch of cultures that developed after the apocalypse. These include the Nora, the Kaja, the Osaram, and many others. 
Each of these have cultural inspirations, which you can likely see from the images there. They could have easily skipped this and gone with the basics of how we feel those cultures should have worked. A commonly held notion, a stereotype of technologically developing cultures is that in the past, men were the hunters, women were the gatherers, men would fight and it was a patriarchy. Now, anthropologically, this is completely incorrect. There is no evidence that we were anything other than egalitarian right up until agriculture developed. But, and, and there are a number of cultures that later developed into matriarchies. In Horizon Zero Dawn, we meet the Nora tribe. Now, the Nora are based on two cultures. They're based on Viking and Native American. It's an early culture. It's focused on hunting and gathering. It's isolationist. It's also a matriarchy. And the characters that you meet in the game, they benefit from the authentic nature of the setting. By using existing cultures, the game has created a cohesive environment that feels authentic. But it wasn't just artists and writers and game developers that came up with this culture. The development, needs, sorry, the development team contacted anthropologists who helped them to develop the cultures that you encounter. They did this by realistically evaluating how certain practices would have developed based on the technology that they had available. As a result, the game feels deep, it feels organic, it feels authentic. By, by using history and anthropology as inspiration, the developers have built an immersive world for their game. And finally, my last point, and something that I fundamentally agree with, is history is cool, and people think so. A few months ago, I did a personal project translating the Assassin's Creed promotional image. Through my work, I found out that they had translated the Assassin's Creed motto, if you will, into hieroglyphs. Even checking the accuracy of a promotional image was enough to get people excited about the game. People were impressed that Ubisoft had commissioned Egyptologists to translate their motto into hieroglyphs and put that much detail into something as superfluous as a promotional image. Furthermore, when I translated it, people seemed really, really interested in what I was doing, to the point where it was interesting enough for a few games journalists to do uh, a few articles on my work. And there's a fundamental reason for this, and that is that people are interested in history. I mean, there are plenty of news articles out there covering whether or not games are accurate. If not, how so? If they did, what was correct? By making games that use history, you not only get a bunch of advocates that write articles and advertise your game for you, but you also get a bunch of players that will want to play the game because of the historical content. Well, how do you find this sort of information? Well, according to Ashraf Ismail, all it is is reaching out to people who know the period, finding people who know the time period well, and just contacting them. That's how he and his team did the research for Assassin's Creed Origins. And obviously, they also hired historians and made deals with universities because they have the means for that. But here's the thing. If it's just a matter of checking a few facts or getting inspiration for clothes or fashion, most historians don't mind sharing their knowledge. Historians are not that difficult to reach, and it likely is not going to take a lot of convincing to get their input. There are various ways to get in touch with a historian, archaeologist or anthropologist. You can look at consulting groups such as the Australian Association for Consulting Archaeologists or the Australian Historical Association. You can contact universities and find out who there has knowledge in the field that you're looking at. Or you could just do a Google Scholar search, find out who's written the articles and contact them directly. And remember, sharing history is what we do. It's what we're here for. Most of us will be happy that thought and is being put into the representation of something that they've dedicated their careers to. And there's also a growing field in archaeology and history that acknowledges video games as a valid platform for education. I mean, just as much as a lot of gamers love history, historians love video games. Currently in academia, the tide is beginning to turn when it comes to their opinion on video games. I mean, you have a few books here based on archaeogaming, which is a developing field, 
which basically is talking about the role of video games in archaeology. And there's also going to be a section at the upcoming European Association of Archaeologists about the role of games in history and archaeology. It's an emerging field and many academics are eager to give their input for the sake of education. And finally, it's important to remember that history is open. All you need to do is access it and use it for the resource that it is. And remember, when you're speaking to an archaeologist, anthropologist or historian, we are more afraid of you than you are of us. <laughs> right. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions? No? That's fine. Um, we don't have any questions at all? Well, I actually have one then. Okay. Um, so I guess my question is, pretty much all your examples given were for games with budgets in tens to hundreds of millions of dollars. What can mm. most of us <laughs> sort, sort of do to do this as opposed to not having the money of like yeah, Ubisoft? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, obviously that was part of my, my... I feel like if you were to just call someone and get someone's opinion on uh, something small, then you can just do that over the phone. No one's going to charge you for checking the accuracy of a certain fact. I mean, if, you, if it was a more long-term project, then you may have to bring someone on board, but I mean, we're, we're academic. We're not in this for the money. <laughs> um, yeah, that's basically it. Any other questions? Um, if, is there any uh, way to find this? Oh. Sorry. <laughs> Tech issues. Uh, are you aware of any um, upcoming projects which has a strong focus on historic content in the games, like Historic Cree, but maybe something which we aren't familiar with? Um, well, I mean, I'm currently working on a, on a game coming out later this year. I, I've signed a non-disclosure agreement, so I can't really go too far into it, but um, ex explores ancient Rome. Uh, and I mean, part of this is the, if you have an idea for a game, and, but you're just not sure what to use for inspiration, look to history because there are so many examples of things that you could be doing, uh, you know, characters and storylines, all that stuff. Um, but ap apart from that, there's not a lot of projects that I'm aware of at the moment. Um, did anybody else have a question? Yes? <laughs> and then he runs. I figured that was the maximum distance you'd have to move. <laughs> Are there any particular uh, like low-hanging fruit? You know, so ah. if I'm if I'm doing if I'm working on a game, it's got a historical uh, bent to it. Are there any particular areas that I'm really going to look stupid if I don't address? Uh, just don't, for the love of God, don't look at Wikipedia. <laughs> <laughs> um, you, there are, and 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 you know, privately owned sites also are rife with inaccuracy. Um, I would say if you have access to any kind of online library like JSTOR or in, you know, whatever university you, you have access to. Also, Google Scholar is a really excellent source, but um, check when it was published. Because usually if it's anything older than five years ago, somebody else has come out with something that's disproven what they've found. So, you know, <laughs> that's, how, that's how we do it. I think we have time for one last question. Sorry, I just want to... Um challenge you a little bit on Wikipedia. Um, I mean, I know it, you know, it drives academics crazy at my background as history as well, but I mean, it, Wikipedia does have a really lively and passionate community that contributes to it. You're unlikely to find anything there, I think, which is egregiously wrong. And while JSTOR is a fantastic resource, it does, it is predicated on you having academic library access to be able to use those resources. So, um, yeah, I don't think that, I mean, I know we all say to first year, don't use Wikipedia but I feel that if you're trying to, you know, just get a start with your world building, that um, it's not a bad place to start doing your reading. And it is, you know, as we like, you know, it's free, it's open. Um, yeah. I suppose I would clarify, you can, you can start with Wikipedia, but maybe verify what you read there. Yeah, with, um, with exactly. Don't, don't begin and end with Wikipedia, but it is, it is a good reference point, I suppose, yeah. Yeah.
um, yeah, cool. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, and we have a lot.